Good morning, Morena. Welcome to the last Nat Chat of the week. Um, I'm Deborah Wright. I'm a naturopath and I'm a massage therapist. And my clinic is Nourish Health and Wellness in Tony in Lower Hutt. With me today, I have Elaine and Nicola. And we're just going to be talking a little bit about um, what it means to be a naturopath as a teacher. That's one of our six principles. And the other is um, treating the whole person and how we engage with our clients and uh, what that means for us as practitioners and also what it means for you as potential clients of naturopaths. So we're going to start with Elaine. Um, Elaine is a naturopath, medical herbalist and aromatherapist, uh, a woman after my own heart. Her clinic is called All the Health You Need and it's located in Point, England. I'd never heard of Point England. I had to Google it. I thought it was somewhere in England. I honestly thought you were coming in from England. I was like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Oh, wow. no. So um, let's start with you, Elaine. I just want to kind of get an idea about why um, educating our patients is so important. Hmm. Um, welcome and uh, nice to be introduced and thank you for the opportunity of being here today. Um, yes, um, education I feel is um, a huge um, part of our consultation in regards to allowing us to help um, our patients understand what could be potentially going on with them with their health concerns. Um, I feel it's very empowering to let them know and learn about themselves and their health. Um, also, there's quite a lot of information out in the media and online, online nowadays um, that can actually confuse people and also, um, you know, give them misunderstandings about what's going on. So um, to come into consultation and just to talk about things and, um, and to have a bit of an understanding of what's maybe going on, um, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally and spiritually for them, I feel is a great opportunity to help them understand. It builds, um, builds them a bit of self-responsibility and self-awareness, um, which I, you know, do try to implement and encourage um, in consultations. Um, so yes, um, and it's also gives them the opportunity of maybe learning something as well, which is, um, you know, it's good in itself to keep your mind going and um, having that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, and I love the fact that um, often when we get clients and we we learn from them, you know, they come yes. in with challenges. People are researching their own health and yes. <laughs> come in with uh, things that perhaps we've never come across before. So it's a two-way street that education thing. Do you find that it deepens the relationship that you have with your clients? Um, yes, yes. I think um, you know it gives some. Um, a bit more sense of um, by you opening up and sharing, um, you're connecting with them and you know in different levels, and it also helps them feel you know um, that they can trust you and they can actually um, feel a bit more sort of self-assured um, if there is any misunderstanding. So yes, I, I do believe you know obviously with a patient, it's a time you know experience so you're you know you're trying to build trust um especially in the first consultation so it is something that you know doesn't just happen but i feel by sharing knowledge and um you know helping them understand and and giving them a bit more um you know sort of concept of um of, of their own health is definitely an important way for them to you know, to start trusting you and building that, um, you know, that relationship between you. Yes. Yeah, I think I think it's really important. And Nicola, I'll introduce you in a little while, but I think with yeah. your work as well, that relationship would be really important too. Yes, definitely. Um, something I found, um, I went away from New Zealand in 2006 and came back in 2012. Um, so I went over to UK and was also in Egypt and prior to leaving New Zealand, I was very, very busy in practice. Um, when I went over to UK, I had to build up a practice again. So coming back, I lost a lot of contacts and a lot of colleagues connections and that really threw me because you can feel very much alone um, if yeah. you're not, you know, you're not connecting with like minded people and, um, you know, people that you trained with and and also building those relationships. So, yes, yeah, I can totally understand that. Yeah, so um, key tips for gaining trust? <laughs> um, for me, I think um, by um, being honest 
and um, you know, going to the trouble of actually learning and understanding about their health condition as well, you know, like um, doing your own research. Um, I also feel that it's important um, to be respectful and to listen to them because if you're not actually listening and um, not actually um, giving them the acknowledgement that you understand what they're saying, there can be quite a few uh, misunderstandings and maybe um, you know, misdiagnosis or um, mismanagement in regards to the outcome of a protocol for them. Um, and it also, I believe, it gives them the opportunity to be listened to, because yeah. in this day and age, I just don't think there's many people out there that are actually um, able to talk and offload and share um, their own experiences because of our lifestyle and the pressure and um, you know expectations that have been put on us. Yeah. So it's it's really you know I think having that time and that opportunity to be able to you know relax and open up and and to you know just talk about things um, you know I feel part of our <laughs> a huge part of our consultation is um, actually counselling and listening to people. So yeah, I think um, you know the the time and listening is important because often people come in and and they don't feel listened to. Yeah. The work, um, Nicola, the work that you're doing is a little different. So do you find that the listening part is as important with, with the clients that you're working with? Oh, absolutely. It's very important to listen to your clients. And I think one of the things that we sometimes forget is clients have lived with their condition for a number of months or years yeah. before they come in to see you. So they've actually got a pretty good idea. If you actually ask them, for their opinion on how they want to be treated. That shows an, an, a tremendous amount of respect for them, uh, getting them to open up to you, but then also them trusting that you will do the right thing for them, not just pull your protocol off the shelf and give them the same thing that they've always had. Um, and what Elaine was saying about taking the time to actually listen, it just lets a person feel like they've been heard um, and that someone has taken the time to um, yeah, to just listen and uh, understand them. Absolutely. And, um, you know, one of the things that as practitioners and naturopaths and uh, herbalists that we need to do is basically live the life that we recommend so that people can understand the potential. So, Elaine, what does that mean to you? <laughs> um, well, I've probably been a little bit lucky sense that my mother was a herbalist so um, right. we grew up <laughs> subjected to us um, you know we were always the guinea pigs um, which was great you know um, we didn't know any difference so um, and um, ironically she used to just go to the doctor just to get a diagnosis and then come home and just use her own <laughs> you know natural remedies that um, that she had and um, homeopathy especially was um, um, huge and herbal remedies um, and for many years my mum was the um, herbs, uh, well Howick Herb Society president so we used to go along oh, okay. to meetings when we were younger and just have a bit of a laugh um, you know we didn't really take it that seriously because it wasn't um, you know something that we had at that time a passion for but um, I've probably been very lucky, so I, I do try to implement, um, you know, my philosophy and my beliefs as a naturopath, a medical herbalist, or aromatherapist, um, as much as I can in my daily life. Yeah. Um, but I'm also a realist, <laughs> and I know that it can be extremely challenging to um, just go back to basics and, um, you know, try to implement, um, you know, back to basics lifestyle. Um, in an everyday appearance, um, you know, routines and everything. Um, and if, you know, I'm also aware that if you have had um, experiences which have thrown you off kilter and, um, you know, put you in a different, um, you know, life lifestyle sort of um, environment, that also could have an effect on your daily practices and, um, you know, um, routines. So, yeah, I think it's important to, you know, my true belief is if I'm not doing it myself, then I, you know, I shouldn't be seeing people. Um, so at times, you know, I have actually taken myself away and gone and seen somebody else, you know, to get my own health looked at. 
Um, it's very important for me to keep, you know, to keep my well-being, um, especially my mental health and emotional health. So yes, I, um, you know, I think it's important to show people that you are living, you know, your philosophy, and um, and it can actually encourage people, especially when you're teaching. It's you know, they see the passion in you, so they're more likely to, oh, I'd like to go home and try that out. And um, Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because, you know, like for me in my clinic, I regard myself as an educator, even though I'm not up front of the classroom teaching people. I see my role as a facilitator of, of actually getting people to engage with their health. And, you know, I've, I didn't grow up with a natural health family. I do recall as a child, my mother used to take us to see the colour man. The colour man used to come to town. And I think that was a bit of a 70s fad, to be honest, or um, might have even been late 60s. But anyway, um, you know, I do remember that. And I remember having the, um, we had some horrible stuff for car sickness and things. So there were elements of it. But it, for me, it was as an adult, and I had my own health, chronic health conditions that I'd had and dealt with, and sort of started looking at alternatives. And I find it quite interesting now how I'm far from perfect. I live in a city. I don't live in a country. I have a small garden. I have a few herbs growing. I do try and grow vegetables when I can be bothered. But, you know, it's about kind of doing what you can and, and making those changes. And I try and encourage my clients to embrace the change that they can make. So it's not about changing everything all at once. It's about looking at the things that you really need to do and working your way down that list. And yeah. I remember when my stepson was very little and we moved into our into our home where we are now and I said to him, let's go and get some dinner. He's like, oh, where are we going to go? And I said, we're going to the garden. And we went out to the garden and we picked all this green stuff out of the garden and he turned to me, he said, but it's just weeds. And I said, <laughs> well, pretty much. But we picked, I had little um, cherry tomatoes growing. He said, oh, what are these? And I said, they're tomatoes. He said, they're not tomatoes. And I gave him one. He said, they don't even taste like tomatoes. And I said, no, they taste like tomatoes are supposed to taste. So it was a real, you know, a bit of an insight for me into the next generations coming through and the way that people are. Nicola, have you got anything you want to add into that? Yeah, I would say trying to live as well as you can is really important to model behavior for your clients. But having said that, I've always said uh, I've got friends who, you know, maybe I'll have a glass of wine or some chocolate. In there. <laughs> You're a naturopath, Nicola. And it's, <laughs> yes, I'm a naturopath, but I'm not a saint. And I think we really have to remember that everyone's human. And uh, we've got to try and tap into what's going to motivate our clients in the best possible way. And that's where if you build that relationship and build that trust, you'll find that you're able to um, give them ideas about how they can maybe take baby steps, maybe not huge leaps, but mm. baby steps. That's all. Just be a little better today than you were yesterday. Mm. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. So we're going to um, just move on to a slightly different uh, topic. So we're talking about teaching and treating the whole person, but we're also looking at the impact that massage and movement has on our body. So Nicola, um, is a naturopath and a personal trainer and a nutritionist and also has a BSc which is pretty awesome. Mm. Her company's called Trek Fit and Nicola doesn't have a clinic, she has a mobile business. So um, in Wellington City and runs Trek Fitness classes. So I want to know more about these Trek Fitness classes before we discuss the importance of massage and movement for our general <laughs> health. Okay. Um, it all it all started for me many years ago when I uh, I lived in Australia for a long time and I'd I'd come back from Canada I've moved about quite a lot a bit and I was really not happy being back in Australia and I found this group that trained women that didn't trek very much and um, uh, how to how to sort of trek and get into that sort of thing so I joined them and I loved it so much I became a coach with them. So I did my uh, my training there and I just fell in love with it. So every year I would do a huge trip overseas. So I've climbed Kilimanjaro, I've been to Bhutan, um, I've done a few other overseas trips. And I just, I love it. That for me is my passion. And so what goes along with a lot of these trips to altitude and things is uh, you have to take certain medications to stop yourself feeling sick. And I, as an experiment of one, decided that as a naturopath, I wasn't going to do that. And I was going to go down the track of sorting myself out so that I could go on these trips and um, be completely healthy. 
and um, be able to uh, to do that. So part of that's training the body and part of it's a, a sort of a nutritional herbal protocol that you take with you. Um, and obviously my clientele has fallen off a little bit in this last year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> So sorry, the trick, the trick training to explain that is basically um, sessions where you are working on carrying a pack, pack um, and so carrying some weight on your body to get your joints and ligaments used to do the, doing that because um, your muscles grow very quickly um, or can grow very quickly and can support a lot of weight. Where things break down is your tendons and your ligaments, which have a poorer blood supply and take a lot longer to build up. So people think, oh, you're going on a trip, you just throw a pack on and you go. Well, by do, day two or three, I think things are going to start niggling and getting injured. And that's what the trick training is all about. It's, pre it's preventative medicine at its finest. <laughs> that's really good to know, actually. Next time I think about going to the Himalaya, <laughs> on my list it's seriously i've always wanted to go to base camp so it's definitely um yeah on, on my list so i mean movement wise i think that that's definitely really important tell me a little bit about your mobile clinic so are they how do they run do you take bookings how do people find you yeah i um, i have a website which um i i will um, give you the link to a, a little bit later um, and people can just get in touch with me through there I do um, I can do uh, personalized uh, plans that you just go and implement yourself or if you're someone that's not comfortable we can book sessions and I often have a few people at a time prior to the lockdown I was running uh, sessions a couple of times a week with about six to seven participants okay. each so yeah. oh, in, in different cool. places around Wellington yeah. I use the Wellington tracks for training well, they're good, they're good hills, good hills to climb. <laughs> yeah. so for you then, treating the whole person, how does that work into your business practice? Well, it's basically about looking at the person. If the person's um, healthy and all they want to do is train for a trek, that's a very different approach to dealing with someone who has maybe some conditions. Um, the area that I like to specialise in is uh, metabolic health. Yep. So, um, Treating someone who maybe has diabetes or obesity as an underlying cause is very different. So um, I would encourage people like that if they're looking to set a goal to get out and, and trekking would be to um, start, you know, way, way out. So you need to be starting on those, getting the metabolism sorted well before you look to um, exert yourself too much. But we can do them in parallel. So yeah. it's, a, it's a little bit of a different... Um, like all of naturopathy, everyone's an individual, so you treat everyone differently. Yeah, and I think that's that's a big part of the education process, isn't it, as well, is actually getting people to understand that uh, no two people are alike. Just because someone down the road managed to cure their illness by drinking yeah. whatever it was that they drank or something happened, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work for, for everybody. And I think... You know, it's really important to remember. So one of the one of the things that we were sort of looking at uh, with treating the whole person is kind of looking at how the body is connected. And I think it's really important to remember that, you know, your, your body doesn't work in separate components. So the Western medical model tends to kind of go, oh, you've got a stomach upset, we'll go and treat your stomach. Mm. We look at it and go, okay, what else has happened? You know, what else is going on? And... I think, um, Elaine, you know, from, an, from your perspective, how do you fit that into your practice? Um, well, I'm a true believer of the mind-body connection. Um, that's just something I've always been fascinated with. Um, so when someone comes and sees me, um, I definitely look at the whole picture in regards to what's going on with them, not just um, in their health condition. Um, but maybe also their, um, you know, their mind and their emotions, if there's been um, situations that they've encountered um, that have actually, you know, created stress in their lives or, um, or situations where they haven't, you know, been able to be, um, you know, in control in some capacity, so it has affected them and affected their well-being as well as, you know, their stress levels yeah. and their mental and emotional um, I'm a true believer in counselling as well. I've, um, you know, I, I go and see a counsellor myself, so I know that's a huge part of being able to, um, you know, connect to what's really going on, the underlying, you know, issues. 
Um, I also do EFT um, techniques, so I know that's extremely powerful and it and it definitely shifts things. Um, I think we've got a whole other session coming that we need to do, <laughs> Elaine, somehow. And I think, Nicola, we need to come out with you on one of your uh, yeah, excursions. Yeah. And, you know, You're very welcome. I think this, is, this has been really interesting. It's fascinating finding out. So, um, Nicola, have you got anything else you want to add into the conversation today? Or Just in... In terms of movement, just all of the benefits that you get from exercise, um, and I would just emphasize that the you know the benefits of an improved sleep, um, yeah. better insulin sensitivity, better functional movement. Your body moves in a better way if you use it. Um, keeping your joints healthy, all of those sorts of things. Just adding in that if you add in exercise outside, we find that we get improvements in depression um, and anxiety. Um, if you go on a multi-day trek, for example, you have the ability to reset your circadian rhythms, which is a huge thing for people mm. who sit in front of screens all day and then have electric light on in the evening. So mm. um, yeah, the exercise and movement, and then on the massage side, uh, you've got all of the benefits you would know, Deb, with the connective tissue improvements and the rehabbing of injuries. So yeah, all important. Yeah. Mm. I think um, the, the, the massage but is one that kind of gets dropped off i think people view massage as a bit of a luxury and you know mm. when i did my training i must admit i sort of i used to get massages a lot I, i've always loved massage but it was a treat mm. the more i work with people and the longer i do it i mean i've been massaging now for um pretty much well, about 17 years and it's really interesting because I've got clients that came to me from the very moment I started practicing as a student and they're still coming. And, mm. you know, we, I, I don't know how many of them take away and, and practice stuff outside of it, but massage seems to anchor them in, in within and, and helps to, uh, you know, fix some of the injuries and things like that. But it's also um, what I found quite interesting with massage is often people will say to me, oh, oh you know i started to feel a bit niggly here and i looked at my diary and i've got a massage book so the body starts to get into its own rhythm yeah. with anything that you do and it's the same with exercise it's the same with nutrition you know it's about teaching and working out what the benefit what, what's going to be good for you and learning that and knowing that it will change um you know no two days are alike no two years are alike and it's uh yeah it's an interesting process Mm. So I think I think we've covered quite a lot today, ladies. I think it's been great. Thank you very much for joining in. Um, I'm going to just ask you to hang on there for a bit. I'm going to stop recording. So what will happen now, um, for the people that are tuning in, um, these are going to be all available on our YouTube channel uh, once everything's up and running. Hopefully this is the last one to get on there. And uh, feel free to click in click through to the links, make contact with the organization, uh, contact any of the naturopaths that you've come across over our week of nat chats and, uh, you know, open to inquiries. So I'll just say um, thanks, Elaine. Thanks, Nicola. And uh, have a great weekend. Yeah, nice, too, nice meeting you both. <laughs> yes, nice meeting you both. Bye. Bye-bye.